The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show with me, Charles Christian. Thank you so much for tuning in again. Along with various ghostly tales and weird stories, our main event this week is an interview with Texas-based author Daniel Duke, who has been researching and writing books on his distant ancestor, the notorious Western outlaw Jesse James. Daniel says Jesse was his great-great-grandfather. But he's also been looking into Jesse's connection with the lost treasures of the Knights Templar. More of that in a moment. But first, time for a ghost story. Almost 45 years ago to the day, in the summer of 1975, I was called to the bar of Grey's Inn, which for those of you unfamiliar with the English legal system, means I became a barrister. Those are the lawyers who wear the old-fashioned-looking 18th-century-style wigs and gowns in court. Now, one of the tasks of London-based baby barristers was to be sent out to the various magistrates' court in the Greater London area to deal with minor criminal cases, such as motoring offences, shoplifting, things like bail applications. And the reason you sent baby barristers was the court system was so chaotic it's apparently even worse today, that although your case or application might only take 10 minutes to be heard, as you never knew when your case was going to be called, you could be hanging around the court all day. Did I mention baby barristers were paid a set fee for this type of work, as distinct from charging on an hourly rate? Uh Aha. Yes, that's the reason we were entrusted with this kind of work. We might be inexperienced, but we were cheap. Now, One of the courts I used to regularly be sent to was Camberwell Green Magistrates Court, which sounds rather cute and rural and countrified if it was actually just a grotty inner city area in South London. As for the green at Camberwell, it still exists as a small park, but all the fine old houses that once surrounded it have long been demolished. This includes a property built in the 17th century, although its origins may have been even earlier, that used to be called the Old House. And it's the Old House that has a ghost story attached to it. About the year 1730, the house was occupied by a wealthy merchant and his beautiful wife. But the marriage was soured by the husband's jealousy. He was convinced his charming wife was involved with affairs with other men and his accusations of infidelity drove the poor woman to despair. One winter's evening, a coach was seen to draw up outside the house, into which a lady entered, instructing the driver to make all haste to the coast. The coach moved off at speed, and its female passenger was never to be seen again. The husband was inconsolable by the loss of his wife. He had accused her too many times, and she had had enough. He made every effort to locate his wife and pleaded his undying love for her, but to no avail. The man went into grief. The house became unloved. The rooms left to dust and cobwebs, cold and empty, with just the memories of the departed woman. In time, the husband was persuaded by his friends to leave the house and try to dispel his grief by travel to sunnier climes. That basically means in those days travelling to Europe. The years of travel seemed to work for the man and when he returned to the house on Camberwell Green, uh, he was no longer overwhelmed by grief and loss. Instead, he was happy because he had found a new bride. The marriage was a success and the friends gathered around him with warm congratulations on his return and his happy future. One night, a banquet was prepared to celebrate the newlyweds. As the guests toasted their husband's newfound happiness, they were puzzled and saddened to observe that the man seemed agitated and depressed. He shouted sometimes incoherent orders at his staff 
and displayed an expression of deep worry. Without warning, the man suddenly left the room and disappeared upstairs. The guests looked at each other in bewilderment, but soon after, the sound of a pistol shot rang out through the house and they all ran up to see what had happened. In a top-floor bedroom, they discovered the blood-stained body of the husband. He had taken his life with a shot to the head. On a table was found a written confession. The husband confessed that he had murdered his first wife in a fit of jealous rage and buried her in the basement. And as to the lady who was seen to enter the coach on that winter's night, it wasn't a woman at all, it was his butler disguised in female attire. The confession note went on to say that after leaving his guest earlier that evening, the husband had entered the room where he was confronted by the ghost of his first wife. It filled him with such dread and horror that in a fit of guilt, he committed suicide. And now for our interview. Daniel Duke grew up in the hill country of central Texas, surrounded by a wealth of stories of lost Spanish and outlaw treasures. Daniel's childhood, along with his education and professional background, intertwined well with his passions which have guided him for the past two decades into researching the mysteries involving his family. Chief among these are those which surround his great-great-grandfather, the Old West outlaw Jesse James, as well as the legends and mysteries of hidden treasures which Jesse and those associated with him are said to have buried. Daniel's hobbies, he says, include writing, genealogy, history, treasure hunting, researching symbols and good coffee. Here's Daniel. And it's uh, my great pleasure now to be talking to Daniel Duke. Hello, Daniel. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Great. Now, the topics we're going to be talking about are your books around Jesse James, um, his mysterious life and fake death, and Jesse James and the Lost Templar Treasure. This is always a fascinating subject for me because I was a kid growing up in the 1950s when TV was full of all the cowboy um, serials and all the movies were there, so, you know... When we were playing in the schoolyard, you know, that one of us would always have to be Jesse James, who had to be shot in the end by all the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's it's very relevant. But um, let's start with the Lost Templar treasure, because my understanding of the Templar sort of mythology is they didn't all get burned at the stake. A lot fled from Europe via Portugal and then headed off out to the Americas and, according to the various legends, taking their treasure with them. Yeah, that's that's what I've, I've read and, and I believe that now after all the research I've done. Tell us more about then your research then. Okay, well, uh, mine started off with Jesse. We were just trying to prove, you know, who we descended from and, you know, they're I grew up hearing the stories. My mother, it, uh, these stories have been passed every time, you know, holidays and family get togethers. Somebody would always bring up the stories of Jesse James and that he faked his death and lived the rest of his life as a farmer here in Texas. And, you know, it was that you grow up here. We would grow up hearing that. And then we go to to school or see that, you know, the movies about Jesse and, and uh, you know, there's obviously something wrong. Uh, Everybody else said that he died. He was shot in the back of the head mm-hmm. dead by, by Bob Ford. Yeah. So uh, we wanted to prove once and for all, you know, whether history was right or our family legends. And my mother started researching it. And uh, a few years later, my sister and I jumped in and started helping her as much as we could. And she wrote three books, uh, basically proving our, our story. We, we went to, um, um, and I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but getting more into the Jesse part of it now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So along with all the stories and photos and other information that was passed down, including his diaries, we had a treasure map that was passed down. 
Ooh, through the oh. mail. Ah, sounds and wonderful. A lot of treasure stories. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. It, it, it was hard to decipher. It wasn't a normal, you know, X marks the spot forty yards away from the old oak tree. It was more a. It was a geometric design with a lot of code written in it. Mm-hmm. There would be normal, you know, words, English words, and then there was a lot of codes and numbers. And it wasn't too hard to figure out the code. That was fairly simple. It was just, you know, a number with a, you know, the number five was the letter E. And, or, or he'd go backwards. And it, it, but uh, yeah. we figured out the code, but we didn't have um, a, a, a place to start from. There was no mention of where to look. You know, it could have been anywhere. So while looking for that, we, uh, I tracked it down. Um, we met some some older people. There was an older man named George Roaming who, when he was a child, knew Jesse when Jesse was an old man. And Jesse had hired him and swore him to an oath, uh, hired him to bury to help him move and bury 680 bars of gold, each one weighing about 15 pounds each. Oh. And uh, you know that's a lot of treasure in itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then over the years, you know, while we were talking to George, and George drew a map for us, we located it, and it's on uh, Fort Hood Military Reservation. So there's no way we're going to get that. Yeah. Um, so we'd met uh, the former Attorney General of the state of Texas, Wagner Carr. He was he was also interested in Jesse James, and he had his driver show my mother and I three locations where large treasures were recovered and they were very large treasures uh, according to the driver one of them took several uh big rigs you know the 18 wheeler tractor yeah. trailer trucks uh several trips she said a lot of trips she said at least half a dozen trips back and forth moving the gold out of this cave and they were so and she said the other treasures were similar in size to that so using that along with george roaming's map and knowing where my grandfather lived, it was I was able to piece the, the puzzle together. I'm, they had a template. They called it a treasure template. So I finally knew the scale and dimensions of it. But while doing that, I noticed the scale and dimensions looked it, it just intrigued me why this why this shape, why this scale. And uh, I started researching that and it led me down a lot of weird rabbit holes uh, towards you know Albert reading Albert Pike. I know that Jesse was a Freemason. After he changed his name and was living as a peaceable citizen, he became a Freemason here in Texas. Mm -hmm. And I knew that uh, Albert Pike had had contact with Quantrill's guerrillas during the Civil War. And, you know, Albert Pike was a famous 33rd degree Freemason here in the U.S. And I thought, well, maybe maybe there's a, a clue there. Uh, mm. George Roman was also a Freemason. And so I thought there's a lot of Freemasons in this. Yeah, so just, I started, just, just jumping back there, because Jesse James rode with Quantrill's guerrillas, did he? Yes. Yes. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And uh, during the Civil War, um, Jesse rode with Quantrill's guerrillas and some other guerrillas, but they uh, they were all under, it was several bands that all grouped under the Quantrill umbrella, I guess. Yeah. Um, but so tracking that down, I wanted to know who put this here, who did it. And while doing, while researching the Freemasons and reading Albert Pike's morals and dogma and other things, I came across a lot of references to Kabbalah, mm -hmm. uh, occult Kabbalah, Jewish Kabbalah, the different forms of Kabbalah. And that led me to Marie Bauer Hall. Uh, she was a famous, she was the wife of another famous Freemason, Manley Palmer Hall. And he'd written a lot, but Marie Bauer Hall had discovered a treasure in Williamsburg, Virginia, that she claimed had ties to Francis Bacon and, and a lot of fantastic claims with that. But, and nobody believed her at first. But she was using codes and ciphers that she broke and located the original foundation of the original Bruton Parish Church, which nobody believed existed, and she proved them wrong. In addition to that, she said there was a treasure 20, a vault under the church um, or under the cemetery near the church that was 22 feet down, and it supposedly contained these amazing treasures and historical information that would change history. So I thought, okay. Here's a spot. I was curious. I tied that in with uh, Victoria Peak, New Mexico. I just drew a line from one to the other, and it was 1,715 miles apart. And that number 1,715 kept turning up in a lot of different ways, including in the dimensions of this treasure template I had discovered. 
and I hope I'm not getting out of out of uh, no nope, off nope. the path on this. Um, so while researching that and, and making note of all these interesting numbers and finds, I kept I wanted it was in a way it was like doing a family tree only with an organization, mm-hmm. and I wanted to know who was behind all this. So uh, while doing that, I found out there's two templates. One's in the shape of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And the main column on the center of the Tree of Life would go from Williamsburg, Virginia, to Victoria Peak, New Mexico, where another large treasure was discovered in the late 30s. Um, And I think, uh, well, that was even mentioned in the Watergate hearings with President Nixon back in the 70s. Yeah. So when when you've got the the hearings for a president, you know, his the Watergate hearings mentioned Victoria Peak and the treasures, uh, and there's a lot of big names, political names, who mentioned it. But um, so that that was part of the Tree of Life template. The other template, there's a large, medium and small version that makes up what I call the veil templates. Uh, They're representative, in my opinion, of the three veils of negative existence that go along with the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Mm -hmm. And while I, I so while studying all that, keeping note of that and trying to find out who was responsible for all this, uh, it led me back to. Some of the, like Bruton Parish Church, for example, the, some of the founding fathers, all of which, all of whom were Masons, Freemasons, not not all the founding fathers, but the ones that met at the Bruton Parish Church, like George Washington, Ben Franklin, and others. Yeah, uh, Thomas Jefferson. They all they were, were all centered around that church, uh, quite a bit around the founding of the the United States and before, and. Uh, I tied it back from them to Francis Bacon, his men. And I thought, okay, I found the guy who was behind this. It lines up with Marie Bauer Hall's story. It Everything fits perfectly. It made, made sense to me. I was satisfied for a few days, but then I got to thinking about it. And I thought, well, who was his mentor? And I was just curious as to see how far I could go back with this. Mm-hmm. And it led to John D., um, you know, the original 007. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, alchemist all he was an amazing man in in his own right um from john d back through different uh alchemists um yep. learned basically enlightened minds throughout europe and jewish rabbis all the way back to rashi and i'm trying to keep this short uh yeah rashi the uh fa- he's a famous rabbi well-known jewish rabbi who was a favored court guest of uh hugh de champagne the one of the founders of the knights templar and that's putting it very quick nutshell, but I'm trying. Uh, it gets. I, I have to do that, or I'll end up on a million different rap, going down a lot of different rabbit holes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we're going way back there to the Knights Templar, which, for people who haven't got their um, history calendars with them, the Knights Templar were the late 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, and then they were suppressed by the Pope in early years of the 1300s, weren't they, first part of the 14th century? Yes, yes, 1307. Yeah. And uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, that, that, that they were reputed to have huge amounts of treasure, possibly even the... Um, Ark of the Covenant that they discovered when they'd been in Jerusalem during the Crusades and all of their treasures vanished and it's thought a lot of them, because they weren't all rounded up and executed, uh, a lot of them headed south into Portugal and there was a sort of successor movement and then when the exploration of the Americas started, they they moved out to the Americas. Yeah, there were a lot of interesting things uh, tied into with that. Like you mentioned, uh, a lot of them went to Portugal. And the, the king of Portugal at the time was said to have been a knight of Christ, which was just the Templar with a name change. Yeah. Uh, uh, Christopher Columbus, some claim he was a knight of Christ. Others say that his father-in-law was definitely a knight of Christ. And they thought that he had been... Uh, employed or he had a side mission there was a lot of interesting stories with that uh christopher columbus supposedly had involvement with it and i thought it was interesting spain funded him but Hmm. when uh christopher columbus but when he came back uh he reported to 
he, the king of Portugal before he, he reported to the Spanish, the people who funded him. And I thought that was really interesting. It's almost like, uh, and the king of Portugal got a claim on it before the Spaniards could. Yeah. And it was almost like, a, that was a shrewd business move, yeah. in my opinion. He, he uh, basically got to draw from the water, got to draw water from the well he didn't dig. Yeah. So, yeah. I thought that was pretty, in- and also Scotland, a lot were said to have fled to Scotland. Uh, I believe the Scots were, uh, um, oh, yeah. excommunicated at the time. And so they didn't really care much for the, the Pope at that time, from what I've read. Yes. And that was a good, it was, so it served as a nice safe haven for a time for the, for the Templar who were fleeing. Yes, it's, it's um, yeah, Roslyn Chapel, that's the place in Scotland that has all the legends associated with it because the architecture inside the sculpture is said to represent um, Templar, um imagery and masonic imagery yes, yes. and and again reputed that there are hidden chambers in there or there were once hidden chambers yeah, yeah. if there are hidden chambers or, or not yeah. yeah and if so what's in them so <laughs> well, well yes there <laughs> indeed so Okay, so we'll accept for the purpose of keeping the story simple that the Templars escaped persecution in Europe, moved to North America and took some or all of their treasure with them to start anew. Now, that's sort of the 1400s, 1500s, period that's still a long way from jesse james what's what what sort of happens i mean you've you've hinted about um the founding fathers of america um george washington and the like but you know again they're still they're still way, yeah they're still 200 years or more adrift from the conquistadores and the um exploration of the americas that's true uh well there were a lot of different the way i view it um you know like I've had a few people ask me, you know, how I thought an outlaw from the old West could have anything to do with the Knights Templar, almost as if that's a, um, a yeah. stain on the Templar name. But I, I've always let them know, you know, it's just my research has led me to that. And if you look at the Templar, they themselves were outlaws. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of stories of Templar becoming pirates over the years. Uh, yes. Jean Lafitte, for example, uh, there you know, with all the different groups who were persecuted in Europe at the time by the church, uh, you've got Jewish people, the Templar, um, anybody who, I mean, back then, if you spoke your mind, you could easily lose your head and ev- or everything you owned, or mm-hmm. both. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of groups wanted that freedom. They wanted the, the liberty to just speak their mind. Um, if, if your scientific, you know, discoveries went against the, the established the powers that be, then you could, you know, you'd house arrest at the best. Hmm. So uh, uh, I think a lot of like-minded people may have banded together. I'm sure once you're an outlaw and you're, you're going to be an outlaw for a long time, you know, like with the Templar, for example, hmm. they were outlawed if they, they could either go into hiding and change everything about the way they, they believed or they could, you know, continue on with what they were doing. And I'm sure some probably did just meld into society and went about their lives like a normal person. But I would think a lot of them, you know, went to Portugal, Scotland, places like that. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to not get stuck on one time, one subject, but the, uh, the leap to Jesse, uh, I, I went about it backwards when I was going, you know, I, I wanted to know about my great, great grandfather. Was he Jesse or not? And we've determined that yes, he was Jesse. We've got a lot of forensic proof and all that. Um, I wanted to know about everybody surrounding him. There was a man named uh, Gervais Fontenot who was associated with him. He was a former U.S. Marshal back in the 1800s. And during his family tree, I found out he was the nephew of Jean Lafitte, the famous pirate. Mm -hmm. So you've got a guy who's a U.S. Marshal, but he's also the nephew of Jean Lafitte. Jean Lafitte uh, had a lot of uh, – he was – some called him privateer. Others called him pirate. It depended on, you know, I guess, which government he was attacking at the time. But, uh, yeah, 
he 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 loved picking on Spanish ships because the Spanish had, had during the Inquisition had supposedly uh, his his great his grandmother was a Jewish lady, and I believe she suffered greatly during the Inquisition. So that was his excuse for right for hounding the Spanish ships yes. in the. So uh, you know, there's ties with Jean Lafitte to Jesse James, but there's a, a lot of other ties, like through Albert Pike, for example, during the Civil War. Some of Quantrell's guerrillas, the group in which Jesse would have been a member, a part of, were camped in the same camp with Albert Pike. And that that gets a little shady trying to find information. It gets hard to find too much information about this during the Civil War on who met and who didn't and, you know, how, how long they fought together. Some of that stuff has been like finding a needle in a haystack. Hmm, hmm. But just putting all these different gr- I know that Jesse was a Freemason. And I know George Roman, who was a Freemason, all the treasures they buried, they used a Masonic, basically took a Masonic oath not to, to say anything about it. Yeah. Um, some, of, some of the people who lived near Jesse, were, were also most of them were Masons and former Quantrill's guerrillas as well. So uh, they all kind of protected each other. They were Masons. And in tying back to Albert Pike and going from Albert Pike through the rest of Masonry, that was, that was fairly easy. Um, just finding the links to Jesse and Albert having any kind of contact. And I found a few references during Civil War records in Oklahoma, which at the time was Indian territory. Mm-hmm. And they had camped they had camped in the same camp for quite for, you know, a couple of weeks, which is more than enough time to get to know one another. Yeah. And I believe that might that is probably where Jesse was first exposed to Freemasonry. And the biggest uh, biggest link I have the, is just the treasure sites um, with Jesse tying him back to the others. All these treasures like Victoria Peak in Williamsburg, Virginia, they, they all fall on a template. And it's not just treasures. There's also historic, mysterious historical sites like uh, the Los Lunas, Los Lunas Decalogue Stone in New Mexico, which is just an ancient stone with Hebrew characters carved into it. And even the Native Americans, when questioned, you know, the pioneers would question them, who put these here? And they said, we don't, basically, we don't know they were here when we got here. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's a lot of interesting things like that. And that, that also lines up on the template perfectly. So in the Kensington Runestone, uh, the Newport Tower in Rhode Island, which some claim John D. either designed or built, helped build himself. There's a lot of different claims on that. Um, but there, and also it even lines up with the Oak Island area yeah, and the treasures associated with that. Now, just going to Oak Island, that I always thought was supposedly linked to Blackbeard or Captain Kidd or one of the pirates that they buried their treasure there. And the treasure they would have been pillaging would have been from the Spanish galleons, but that would have been the gold and, and silver that they, the Spanish were taking from the Aztec areas of Mexico and the Inca areas of South America, and they were taking that gold back to the mainland, uh, back sorry, back to Spain. And mm-hmm. so the pirates all operated around there to attack the treasure fleets i've often i've heard the same stories and that makes a lot of sense but um the thing that really intrigued me about oak island and i was always kind of iffy about oak island i didn't know if it was more you know how legends get they end up taking on a life of their own and growing way beyond what they really were but uh there was a man named petter emmonson and I, I saw him on a – he's written a book. I've also seen him on a, a documentary. I think it was Cracking the Shakespeare Code or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Well, he went to Oak Island, and he was he was interested in some of the the ancient stones that were pla- said to have been placed in a pattern. And people, people were pulling a pattern out of it, you know, different patterns. But he went further. He located all these stones. And the, the interesting thing to me is those stones made a perfect tree of life, the Kabbalistic tree of life shape. Which blew my mind because not only did my template match, you know, tie in with that area, it was that there's two templates: the veil template and then the large tree of life template. Yeah. And it, I thought that's that that blew my mind. It was like 
when I saw that, I was so excited. I wanted to add it to my book, but my book was already in the editing stage, and I couldn't make any changes at the time. Yeah. But um, so I contacted him and and talked to him a little bit. He's an interesting man. But it just it was almost as if Oak Island was a small pattern of the bigger picture. Right. Yes. And and if you look into the, the Kabbalistic tree of life and the veils and the designs of the template, it's almost like even each part mirrors the whole. And it reminds me, it's not just the Kabbalistic tree of life. It also reminds me in some respects of Indra's net and other religious beliefs. Uh, so yeah. it's like a grid pattern and each little section mirrors the, the whole. Yeah. Yes. Which may also make sense for burying treasure. It's a grid pattern. And uh, if, you know, to topography changes over the centuries, but if you've got the grid pattern, the dimensions and the scale, it doesn't really matter what the land looks like. You'll always be able to find it. Yeah. Yeah. There is a similar belief in the UK that um, there's a kind of sacred geometry associated with Templar sites and you know, they're geometric and that they link together and that there's some kind of uh, connection between them. And again, they're very complex. It's not just a sort of straight line. Here's one Templar preceptory, here's another Templar preceptory or uh, whatever. That they, they, they are all inter interwoven with each other. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I've seen that also, and I, I definitely agree with it. Um, yeah. Well, and another thing, parts of the template, even you know the uh, veil template, the dimensions and scale, it matches the uh, the temple in Jerusalem, and, and it just uh, that that blew my even the angle at which the template you know it's seven degrees um, off of due north. I mean it's 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 not it's not due north and it's not northwest and east. You know due north, it's a little off, and it, it's angled. It's and that the the temple in Jerusalem is the same way. Yeah, it just may. The, I, the deeper I look, <laughs> oh, and also on the western door of the the temple the church in um, London, yeah, the, on the west door, there's a design that matches the template it, almost exactly. It's a little yeah. bit, a little more um, elongated, but otherwise it looks just like the template. It looks like it's been stretched out a little bit. What about the actual treasure? You mentioned tales of. Lots of 18-wheeler uh, trucks carting treasure off. Is any mm -hmm. of this treasure visible in museums, available to see, or anything of that nature? Or has it all just sort of disappeared? It disappeared. It disappeared. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what happened to it. I know um, there are groups who, well, well, the treasures here in Texas that, that yeah. Wagner Carr showed. You know, and, yeah, Wagner Carr, former Texas Attorney General, uh, had his driver show us these, and she told us the Texas Rangers guarded it while it was being uh, recovered, and they they kept they kept it low. But there were a lot of Texas Rangers on that property. It's just twelve miles from here, and she said they guarded it and kept an eye on it while they were recovered it all. Um, there's there all the other treasures. If they're not if they've been recovered, I don't know what happened to them. Right. Right. If they just kind of disappeared. No trace is left other than a hole in the ground. Yeah. And you, you, well, actually, not even a hole. You can tell where they filled it in and covered yes. it up. Because that's the same with Oak Island, isn't it? They've never actually found anything there. It's just yeah, en yeah. En I, I, endless pits and galleries going down. And um, I mean, uh, they find odd things, remnants of logs and uh, pecan. I'm um, not pecan. Coconut fibers, palm leaves, things like that. But yeah. there's never. No treasure that I know of has been found. Yeah, but sufficiently in the pits, they've found what would appear to be platforms or levels, as you're saying, the the timbers and the um, coconut palms and things that clearly yeah. somebody put them there by design as opposed to they just ended up there. Yeah, even yeah. The, the tunnel that, um, I think it was the way the story went, some men moved a stone and that opened a flood trap and flooded the whole thing and the they found according to what they found they claim to have found is there's a, a flood tunnels were dug to for that purpose if you if you moved the stone the whole thing flooded yeah. and i don't know i don't know if they found anything or not but i think there's been mention of i 
think, one gold coin. But that was found away from the diggings. It was found on the island. So yeah. that could have been, you know, I yeah. guess that could have been from anybody. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've often wondered if the Oak Island wasn't a distraction or maybe perhaps a, a staging area just to hold it temporarily and then move it later. But if they were to hold it temporarily, why would they go through all the trouble of digging such a deep hole? Well, well that's that's the thing that you have to scratch your head on and you think, well, you know, in days of reality TV, then possibly um, you could imagine somebody thinking, hey, let's do this and make a television program about it. But exactly. these things are long, long, long pre-modern times. People just didn't have the time or inclination to indulge in practical jokes of a, a complex nature like that. So you have to say, well, it was clearly put there for a purpose, the most likely purpose for, for, for a large pit in the ground is to bury something at the bottom of it, treasure being the most obvious candidate. Well, the treasure in Victoria Peak, and like you'd mentioned, uh, Captain Kidd and Blackbeard and all the, all the other candidates for, for yeah. I guess, the people who may have been involved with Oak Island. Um, if you look at some of, like, Victoria Peak in New Mexico, for example, which was also recovered it was said to have held treasures that dated back through different different uh, different centuries throughout history. I mean, there were there were some that were very old, like 15th century coins and emeralds and things like that. The coins were easier to date, and then they even had um, Pony Express mail pouches from the 1800s. And you know, there were it was treasures that predated the founding of the United States by yeah. a long shot. Yeah. And then, you know, and it just, it's um, it's almost as if, and that lend, lends credence to my theory, in my opinion, that, uh, you know, it's it's been a group effort over throughout the centuries. Yes. So, and what group could do that other than, you know, Rosicrucians, Freemasons, Templar, and I guess they're allied, they're allies. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the mystical secret societies that uh, we know existed throughout Europe, from, as you say, from the time of the Templars onwards. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and also the the seven lost the lost cities of Cibola. It was supposed to be seven cities of gold, and that I'm really intrigued by that. A lot of people claim Victoria Peak was one of those cities, and the others, I believe, the seven cities would be the lower, in my opinion, the lower seven Sephiroth on the Tree of Life, or Sephira mm. on the mm. the. Cap Tree of Life. I think the top three are more of a spiritual nature, whereas the lower seven would be a more of a physical nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just one area. There's a couple. I know two of Victoria Peak and one of the sites that was recovered here in Texas line up with the Tree of Life template. And there's a couple of other places I'd love to go look. I'm making plans to go look just to see if I'm right. I don't even really care. Oh, of course, I would love a little treasure, but who wouldn't? <laughs> but yeah. you know, I just I want to know if I'm right on the money. One thing that I did like uh, that really boosted my confidence is this. In this was the uh, uh, current Grandmaster of the Night Templar, Timothy Hogan, uh, wrote a glowing endorsement for my book. Basically, said I was right on the money. Hmm. Brilliant. That made my day. I mean, when I got you know, that kind of endorsement, I thought, yes, I know I'm on the right track. So. so are you doing any further investigations into the treasure side of the saga? The treasure side, I will probably always be investigating. But uh, currently, I'm, uh, my sister and I co-authored the second book, uh, The Mysterious Life and Fake Death of Jesse James. And I'm currently writing a third, which will, I hope, is the last book on Jesse James. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, he was my ancestor, but I, there's only so much you can write before you get a little burned out on it. So, yes. On just yeah. him. Yeah. But he, he was so interesting. There's uh, a lot of groups that tie into to, uh, powerful positions and uh, po politicians to, to this day. But I, I'm not writing anything about current politicians. I'm just... I'll try, I'll stop. I plan on stopping that around the 60s or 70s. Yeah. Yes. I don't want to ruffle too many feathers and making enemies. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. Let's let's go uh, back to 
the Jesse James side of the story. And you're saying, you know, it was a family tradition that you were connected, that he was your great, 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 is it? How many greats was he back? He was my great, great grandfather. Great, great grandfather. Right. Um, Where did that come from? Because I say, we've obviously got the story that he was shot dead and that was the end of it. He died when he did. But. Where did the tradition sort of stem from that he didn't die, uh, that he moved to Texas and changed his name? Okay. Well, a lot of people don't realize in, uh, you know, he was claimed to have been shot and assassinated in 1882. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know or realize that he was, he tried to fake his death another time in 1879, a couple of years earlier. And several other times there would be rumors of his death and th- the family his family and friends would just go along with it. Um, he wanted out. He got married and relocated to Texas in 1871. And but you know they he kept up his robbing. It was it was almost more of a mission than than just something he wanted to do. Um, and that was another thing. It was he was doing it for a purpose, kind of like uh, Jean Lafitte. A lot of these pirates, and you know when you think of the old West, it's usually written as. Oh, it's just some wild guy who got on the wrong side of the law, and they all died poor, yet they rode around robbing all their life and until they were shot or killed, you know, or yeah. hung. And that's not the case with a, some of them. A lot of them, yes, that was the case, but there were certain outlaws who who I believe, well, like Jesse and Billy the Kid, for example, they, they had contacted one another in 1879 around the time Jesse had faked his death. Um and then, you know, there's the mysterious circumstances of Billy the Kid's death. Yes. And there are other outlaws. But Jesse he had relocated to Texas in 1871, and they were all over the place. Uh, their gang also used the same tactics they used during the Civil War under Quantrell's guerrillas. They would split up and rob multiple targets uh, in the same, you know, in, it, you'd have two or three robberies in the same, in a day or two, several states apart. And then people were scratching their heads trying to figure out how... Jesse had possibly robbed that many banks and, you know, in such a, so far apart from one another. Yeah. So, uh, but, so he was living in Texas. He wanted to fake his death. He was starting a family. He wanted a peaceable life. The circumstances around the civil war, they, he tried to, to surrender at the end of the civil war. And when he rode up to Lexington, Missouri, there were a uh, union pickets open fire on him and shot him through the lung, his right lung. So, uh, somehow he lived and he got away and that was the second time he'd had a bullet through that lung. I don't know how he lived both times, but he lived, um, you know, he, they, they were branded as outlaws. They became outlaws. And I think uh, there's a lot of mystery involved in what, what exactly they did with a lot of the catches. They like their first robbery was around $60,000 back mm-hmm. then a nice 200 acres and a house cost you about $5,000 in yeah. Texas. So, you know, $60,000 went a long way. Yeah. Um, they didn't just go into town and blow all that. They were also known for being secretive, and they didn't hang around saloons and towns, you know, blowing their money. So when people claim they died broke, it's trying to figure out how they would have done that when they, they, they lived low-key and didn't spend too much. I, I don't believe that, that they died broke. But uh, 1871, he moved to Texas. He lived here. He was starting a family. He had several kids. His second daughter, who was my, his second child, who was my great grandmother, Ida, she was born shortly before the alleged assassination in 1882. And I, he, I don't think he planned it. I think his cousin, the guy who was killed in his place, I believe, was his cousin Wood Height, who was shot and passed off as Jesse. He bore. He was known to have bore. They said he bore a strong resemblance to Jesse, and. Did, he looked like him, only he uh, chewed tobacco and Jesse didn't. That was the only differences. Yeah. Uh, you know, the slight, other than slight physical differences, but he looked enough like him to pass, be passed off as Jesse. Another thing is the law chasing him never knew what, he, what Jesse looked like. Some said he was tall, over six foot. Others said he was 5'8". Uh, it was just different heights. Nobody had an accurate description of him other than his family and his gang members who were also his, his only friends. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, the people who lived in his area, they were all related. So it was relatives and, and his gang. The, yes. And they, 
they would have, it's easy to see how they would have sided with him and said, yeah, that's Jesse. They were the only ones anybody trusted to identify the body. Yeah. And they couldn't even be trusted. Um, the night Bob Ford shot, we believe, Wood Height, um, they went and they, the law for, the law enforcement retrieved, they, they went and got Jesse's mother, Zerelda, brought her up to St. Joe, Missouri, St. Joseph, Missouri, and uh, had her identify the body. She walked in and said, gentlemen, you are mistaken. That is not my son. Somebody grabbed her by the arm and led her outside. And this is just according to all the historical accounts. Led her outside, and she came back about five minutes later uh, crying and cursing everybody involved in killing her poor boy. So I think somebody let her know, hey, you know, just go along with it. That's that's Jesse. So she went along with it. Um, at the funeral a few days later, she was recorded, you know, when they were burying him, Jess, the body in uh, the at the James farm, Jesse's aunt came up and asked him, was, and she's recorded as asking Zerelda or saying, that's not the Jesse I knew. And Je- uh, Zerelda said, Shh, that's my rabbit's foot. And mm-hmm. you know, what, what, what grieving mother would call her dead son a rabbit's foot? It was like my lucky charm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was interesting. There's a lot of little tidbits here and there that discount um, the, that. Another thing, the, the woman who was allegedly married to Jesse and had two children with him, during the coroner's inquest, she couldn't, she, she didn't know his age. She didn't know if or if one of his, the tips of one of his fingers was missing, and if so, what hand it would have been on. Um, she, there were a lot of things she had no clue about Jesse. She didn't know how old he was. This is a lady who had children with him and supposedly had been married for several years. Didn't know his age, didn't know if he was missing a finger. She didn't know a lot of things about Jesse, but when I asked her if, if any uh, jewelry was left in the home, she described every piece of jewelry down to fine detail. <laughs> You know how many diamonds was in a brooch and things of that nature. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that there's it's a preponderance of evidence that lead, lends credence to the fact that it wasn't Jesse. Um, fast forward to 1995, when the James Farman Museum got a they they had an exhumation done to prove once and for all whether it was Jesse in the grave or not, and they claimed they had proof from D, you know DNA proof that it was Jesse and history was was correct. Well, when you look into that, the uh, the Clay County Commissioner Stephen Caruso at the time, he he uh, he said it was he and this is a quote from him. It was a tawdry sideshow. He didn't agree with it. Didn't like the way they were handling it. They dug up the entire grave. They found several bones from a from a woman and a man in the same grave. Um, but there were there they got no DNA from the grave they exhumed. So they got a court order. This Dr. Stars, who was who was heading the exhumation, uh, he wasn't even, actually Professor Stars. He wasn't a doctor. He was a, an attorney, a law professor. He had no, forensics, or he wasn't even a forensic anthropologist. It, that was his hobby, yeah. uh, just digging up famous characters and trying to prove whether or not they were, you know, it was really yeah. them. Um, so he, he got a court order to get a, a tooth and a sample of hair from the James Farman Museum to see if that, um, you know, to, and test the DNA to see if it matched. So they, the James Farman Museum had a Tupperware bowl in 1978. The curator of the museum dug up the yard and found a dog's tooth, a hog's tooth, a human tooth, and several other animal bones. And he put that in a Tupperware jar and would hand a lot of them out to his friends and, and people he wanted to impress. Mm-hmm. So they, what was left behind was a tooth and some other bones. And they, so Pro, uh, Professor Starr's got a court order to test that tooth and a sample that was supposedly Jesse's hair. Stephen Caruso, the, the Clay County Commissioner at the time, was in possession of that hair as he was their attorney. So he told my mother and I face to face in person that the the hair he pulled the hair they tested he pulled out of his friend's head john hartman who was the clay county parks director pulled the hair out of his friend's head put it in an envelope and submitted that and the tooth he never said where he got the tooth but he said i guarantee you the tooth came from similar uh, yeah it, or, or its origin was of similar circumstances yeah uh, or similar origins um, so the tooth and the hair, there's no, no way, even if it were the tooth and hair, 
the tooth or bones that were found in the yard, there's no proof as to who, whose it was. Um, and they, they came out and pr- said, you know, we, the way they presented it was like, we exhumed the grave, we've got the DNA, it was Jesse. The guy they tested, the two people they tested the DNA against who were allegedly descendants of the James family, their, their ancestry is highly questionable. They're, and the other thing, there was a lady named Sue Laura Hale who's a direct descendant of the James family. And she was alive. She was in her 90s, 80s or 90s in California. She was alive. Our side knew about her. The James Farman Museum and all their genealogists knew of this lady. She was the real deal. They didn't go to her. I don't. I, nobody knows why. She would have been the closest living descendant. So mm-hmm. my mother contacted her, and she submitted DNA through a, trick, a strict chain of custody to our doctor here in Texas, a DNA expert in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and he's got it on file. He tested my mother's DNA against hers, and it showed they have a close re- close family relationship. But according to him, and I agree with it, in a situation like this, you need to cross all your T's and dot all your I's and do each step of the family up, you know, from yeah. our mother all the way up to Jesse. Yeah. So it's a lot of exhumations, and that was the other thing. We tried to exhumate or exhume Jesse, and uh, tried to get a court order to exhume him. And we weren't going to dig his body up. All you have to do is bore a small hole into the grave and retrieve a dime-sized piece of bone. And you just test that. But half of our detractors, um, they fought us in court. And basically, it was a stalemate. So we didn't get the order. They didn't get their way. But we, the, the judge just basically said, we need to find a little more proof and then try, try it again. Mm-hmm. He didn't close the doors on us. We're, we're just taking our time and trying to do everything exact, you know, ju- yeah. it has to be done well enough to stand up in court through a, a lot of scrutiny. There's so much in this story and there, there's a lot I've left out. I just need to, uh, I try to, I'm trying to get the main points and tie it all, all together. Yeah. Sitting here in my room writing and not speaking to anyone, it makes you feel like a hermit and you start to lose your, <laughs> your, your voice, your ability to speak correctly. So. <laughs> Uh, not that bad, surely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you ever so much for your time. That has been brilliant. What other projects on you hinted at that you're working on a um, a third and final book on the James family? Yeah, uh, the third one is Jesse and well, connections that Jesse had to several in, from ranging you know to several powerful people and groups. Um, Ranging from you know his his father uh, connections his father had and it just shows that it is basically tying in the first second and third you know the whole story in three books mm-hmm. um, it, different powerful people and organizations that they'd had connections with and how those powers and influences continue on to the, our near present day. What's the time scale for that? Well, I'm turning the manuscript in September 15th, and it should be out sometime next year. Oh, imminent then. Yes, that's brilliant. Well, Daniel, thank you ever so much for your time. That was really interesting. And good luck with your third and final book in the trilogy. And have a great weekend. Well, thanks. You too. It was a pleasure being on your show. I'm highly honoured, and I hope to talk to you again someday. You're very intelligent. You're very interesting to, to talk to. Well, I've been intrigued with all this stuff and uh, as well. You know, I I love all this. Um, what happened to all these tons of gold that the Spaniards found? I'd like found? to know, too. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to know, too. Oh, well, like the gold they, they found in Victoria Peak back in the late 30s in, or the, in the 40s was valued by some sources as being worth around $3 billion. Mm. That... And that was back when gold, I believe, was in a, in U.S. dollars was around thirty two fifty an ounce. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's a lot of gold. And on yep. top of that, especially yeah, as it's they, now two thousand dollars an yeah. ounce. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a treasure like that, there there are a lot of rumors. Some some people claim that uh, LBJ, President LBJ, got his hands on some. I don't know how true that is, and I'm sure there's if if there is a. a 
proof of that, it would be highly guarded, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. But uh, just the fact that it was mentioned by all the politicians in in uh, New Mexico and in the Watergate hearings, it's it lends a lot of credence to it. Yeah, it, it yeah. goes to me. It elevates it beyond a uh, interesting campfire tale. <laughs> put, uh, put some legs on it. Yeah, it's definitely been more than an interesting campfire tale. Thank you ever so much. It's been a delight talking to you. Thank you. Same to you. You have a great week. You can find out more about Daniel Duke on the following websites, www.authordanduke.com and www.jessewjames.com. But do remember that W between Jesse and James. And still on the subject of the Knights Templars and their lost treasures, which are said to have included not just gold, but also the Holy Grail and the Ark of the Covenant, and which may have been buried at the bottom of the Oak Island money pit Daniel made reference to, there's a new book out by David Goodswad called The Westford Knight and Henry Sinclair. This explores the theory that two Scottish Knights Templars called Henry Sinclair and James Gunn, landed in what is now the Massachusetts and Rhode Island areas of the US in about 1398, so 100 years before anybody else, bringing with them some of the fabled Templar treasures. And that's it. Almost time to go, but before I do, one last tale. You may have caught a reference to Sir Francis Bacon, the late 16th and early 17th century English philosopher and statesman who, among other things, is said to have been the man who really wrote all Shakespeare's plays and dabbled in the occult. Less memorable is the fact he died of pneumonia after an early experiment stuffing a fresh chicken carcass with snow to study the effects of freezing on the preservation of meat. Yes, a man called Bacon may have invented the frozen chicken drumstick 400 years ago. Now, it just remains for me to say this is Charles Christian saying thank you so much for listening in. Please join me again next week for more weird tales for these weird times. Until then, stay well, stay weird, stay different. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon which means it's time for us to go you've been listening to the weird tales radio show with charles christian your weekly fix of ghost stories urban myths witchcraft magic and folklore you can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on twitter at Christian Uncut. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Good night.